Okay, and we are now recording. Um, so first of all, I've updated the study roadmap a little bit, um, which actually makes today's OAuth discussion a bit out of place, but since it was already scheduled, we're going to keep it there. Um, biggest difference is since we've already been talking about SAML and SSO, I wanted to continue down that path. And so we are still going to do the OAuth overview today. Again, it's slightly out of sequence now. Um, but then we're going to keep going into SSO, kind of play around with that some more or then go into OpenID, which is kind of an extension of that, talk about how we're going to implement SSO in communities, and then come back to OAuth and then do some remainders um, related to Canvas and security and a few things like that. Um, so uh, thank you for your patience with that. I figured it would be best to just kind of stay on the path of single sign-on for now while we were already there uh, and then go back to OAuth. So with that, today's presenters are going to be Jasim, uh, Winnie, and then all of us get to talk about OAuth. And then after we talk about OAuth today, we're going to kind of put it on a shelf for a week, go back to single sign-on, and then week after next, we're going to deep dive into OAuth again. But so the discussion today will hopefully give you some familiarity with it. If at the end of the session you're still a little bit confused, then you've got a week to kind of brush up on the high-level concepts of OAuth before we have to go deep with it. Um, and Jasim, I see you are on and ready. So go ahead and I will stop presenting. And then if you can do a show and tell of the SSO setup from Trailhead. All right. Thanks, Natalia. Um, how do I press it? Okay. All right. Can you guys see my screen? It's coming. Yep, we see it. Or All I right. see it. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I want to show you uh, the SSO setup from Trailhead today. Uh, before that, I just want to uh, quickly touch point few points. Um, First of all, uh, my domain. My domain is uh, a, an important prerequisite for SSO, or on, in other words, uh, uh, you know, my domain is required uh, for you to set up inbound SSO or when you uh, set up external providers uh, with Salesforce for your SSO. So that's important to know. Uh, second, uh, SAML and OAuth. Um, you know, we touched on that last time. We talked about difference between SAML and OAuth. Um, so uh, it's important to know that you know SAML uh, is not the only protocol uh, we can use for uh, setting up SSO. Um, third, uh, identity provider. Uh, we talked about that today. What I'm going to show you is IDP initiated SAML SSO. So uh, it's important to know that. Uh, believe me, there are questions in, in the exam. Uh, I've given it once uh, regarding the difference between IDP-initiated SAML and uh, SP-initiated SAML. So just want to stress that point. Uh, authorization and authentication. Again, you know, when we talk about SSO, uh, I like to see that under uh, the big umbrella of identity management. Um, what we have, what we accomplish using SSO is authentication, basically validating who you are. But it's important to know that there is uh, uh, other important half to this identity management, uh, which is authorization, basically what you can do. So when you authenticate a user against your system, you uh, might, uh, you, you better know what he's doing is what he's supposed to do. So. So just want to stress that point as well. And then uh, lastly, federation ID and username. Everyone know what, what's a username. We all have a user record in Salesforce. But federation ID is, is something, an external ID uh, uh, to your user. You know, So it can be your employee number or employee um, uh, ID or something like that. Uh, uniquely identifies you in the system. All right, with that, let me jump in. Uh, so today, I'm going to use Axiom as the IDP, the identity provider. It's a Heroku uh, app. I, I believe it was uh, created by Salesforce developers to test their um, SSO and auth. There are a lot of options. It's free. Uh, but I'm going to go with Sales, uh, sorry, SAML identity provider and tester options today. And I have 
a freshly created arc for this demo. So first step for uh, setting up SSO is uh, uh, introducing your identity provider to Salesforce. So you do that by setting up identity provider in Salesforce. For that, you go to the identity branch and you can see a lot of options out there. You can set up different auth uh, authorization providers here. Uh, you can set up uh, identity connect. Um, we'll touch on that later, I guess. Uh, you can set up uh, Salesforce as an identity provider, et cetera. So I'll go on to the single sign-on settings first. So for setting up SSO, first of all, you need to enable SAML. So I've, I've done that. And you have different options. You can uh, you can get the metadata file from your uh, IDP and then just upload it here uh, instead of going through the manual setup. But for the purpose of this show and tell, let's set up the SSO manually. So uh, I'm going to give it name now issuer issuer is nothing but uh, the the entity id of idp uh, it's given by idp uh, so it is it is something uniquely identifies that idp uh, because you can have multiple uh, idps set up right uh, you can have employees coming through one idp you can have your customers coming through different idp so issuer is, is, is an important field that you need to populate. Uh, for this purpose, since I'm using Axiom, I have the flexibility to put anything here, as long as I match it with what I put in Axiom. Now, I'm switching back to Axiom. Uh, first of all, you need to download a certificate, uh, a binary X509 certificate. Uh, basically, this is the certificate that kind of uh, uh, the, establish the trust between IDP and uh, uh, service provider. So I downloaded that. I need to choose that. And you have the request signing certificate. You can choose the, the certificate you, you have uh, saved in your um, um certification uh, folder uh, inside salesforce um you have the signature method um, not an expert in this but you can choose rsa for this demo um assertion decryption certificate so you, if, if your assertion is encrypted you can choose a certificate here to decrypt it uh let's not make it complicated so i'll just choose assertion is not encrypted for the time being. Now, identity type, SAML identity type. Now, you have three options here um, to, to um, identify uh, your user. Um, you can have your username of the user in the assertion, or you can have federation ID. Um, we talked about that before. Or you can have user ID, which uniquely identifies the user. So let's choose with Salesforce username, um, identity location. It, it's going to be on this in the subject. Again, uh, it depends on how you set up your IDP. Uh, for the request binding, the the method I'm going to choose HTTP post for the time being. And when I switch to uh, Axiom, I'm going to hit generate here. I'm choosing the SAML version 2.0. So since I chose username in the setup in Salesforce, I'm going to put username uh, here. Again, it has to match so that the handshake happens without an issue. And we know the, the location, like we discussed, it's going to be in the subject of the assertion. So all the setup is going to be part of uh, the assertion that's created by Axiom or the IDP. So we have to be careful here. A issuer, we talked about that. Since I put Axiom there, I'm going to put Axiom here. But again, 
when you set up IDP uh, in real case, IDP is going to give you what that issuer is. Another important piece is the recipient URL, which is basically the login URL. Um, you're going to get it once you set up the single sign on settings. So let's complete that on the Salesforce side. Uh, before that, I have one more required field, which is entity ID. Now, for this entity ID, um, you know, again, like we discussed, you know, my domain is is important, uh, is required. So usually, um, that's what you put it here, the, your subdomain or your my domain. Make sure you have that match. It has to be with your HTTPS. So it looks like I have everything all required. Um, you can see some of uh, fields have left blank. It's not that important. For example, if your identity provider has a login URL, you can put there. Uh, if you want your customers or your uh, or your users to go to some particular URL once they log out, you can put that custom URL here. Um, if you want, uh, uh, if you have a public uh, uh, URL, um, like a like a Visual Force page site or something like that, which is publicly accessible, which you wanna keep it for your error handling. Uh, you know, you want to see, you want to take a user to that particular URL, you can put that in custom error URL uh, column. Uh, but I'm just, I'm just going to leave it blank here. So let me save that. If you remember, we left one important piece, which is the login URL. This is the URL um, IDP is going to post its assertion. Let me copy that and go to your IDP and put it in the recipient URL. All right. Um, so it looks like just going to validate if I have everything. OK. So it looks like I, ha I have everything. So this is the point where user uh, blocks into uh, IDP. Um, so imagine you are in your Active Directory and you log in. So that's when you, the IDP, create that assertion. So if you, let me expand this assertion. If you look at this assertion, again, a lot of things doesn't make any sense to me. But if you look at here, you can see the X509 certificate is here. And at some point, you will see the assertion starting. Yeah. So you have your assertion in this packet. You can see the recipient URL where it's going to post, or you can see that here as well. Um, and it's you can also see the subject information, which is the username for the time being. OK, so now, um, like we said, let me just quickly show you the the visual diagram what happens in an idp initiated sample so um, uh, we talked about user authenticating against idp you know that's when the assertion is created so that's the first stance that we did uh, second the user is directed to salesforce using a link or button uh, and then once you click it that's when idp post saml to salesforce and then salesforce validates uh, that that saml uh, and then the session is generated or user is successfully logged in, okay? So I'm gonna do three and four step here. So this is my button here, this is login. So as soon as I click this login, this assertion is gonna be posted to Salesforce. But before that, let me log out. Otherwise this demo is gonna be unimpressive. <laughs> so let me log out. All right, I'm going to go in. If everything is good, I'm going to be logged in. That's it. So we logged in. Our SSO is good. Now I want to touch two more points before I wind up. Um, if you go to, again, the identity bracket and single sign-on settings, 
you will see uh, a validate. I, th I think Winnie is going to talk about it, right? Actually, Winnie is um, having problems. So if you could talk about it and show us how we're how it works, that would be great. She's on the West Coast and she's got a power outage right now, and she's no oh, okay. can get good internet. Okay, sorry, Winnie. Um, so uh, yeah, so we have this sample assertion validator. If you click that, you can validate against your setting. And for some reason, uh, well, it doesn't have a response there to validate. So if you copy yeah. paste that response from Axiom, I think Maybe you'll that's probably that's get some better information. Let me. If I can go back to action, yes. And you just copy paste the entire thing, all of that, right into the box. Right, we go here. You validate. That's it. Thanks, Natalia. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> You'll see um, all that that's happening. You can you can see everything is green here. Uh, you can see the status here. The subject again was username, and they'll give you the assertion ID. One more thing before I wind up. Uh, there is a second place you can go uh, to validate your login. That's, of course, your login history. And you can see that uh, I've logged in, in each, before um, uh, using the IDP initiated SSO. So, uh, okay. so you can call out the login type for you. Okay. So, Jasim, can you go back to the SAML validator? Since we're, we're going to put you on the spot here a little bit. So, thanks for playing along. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you still have the Axiom tab open. So can you go over to Axiom and yeah. go back one screen from where you were? Okay, and then change something here, like put the wrong username in Yeah. yeah and have yeah. it generate the assertion. And let's see what the SAML validator does with the bad assertion. Actually, if the time was there, I would have done that, but I thought my time is running out. Sure. Single sign on error. Uh, I think I need to go back and copy that validator, right? Yep. Copy that. Validate. Yes, so it says unable to map the subject to a Salesforce.com user, which makes sense because I put the wrong username and it seems to not match to you. Okay. Yep. So one other thing, let's go back to Axiom, put the right username, but put a capital letter somewhere and see if it'll still work. Hmm. Okay. So you want to see if it's case sensitive? Uh-huh. And remember the M on the end though. Let's put two capital. <laughs> Best. We did a single sign-on for a client that used used Azure, and they uh -huh. they ran into case sensitivity issues. So I'm wondering if it was just Azure specific, or if this is a SAML thing. Oh, it logged me in. Interesting. Okay. Oops, sorry. That was from my previous, sorry. No, that's the new one. It, it, it's got it there because it shows the subject with the capital letters, but it's unable to map it. So I think it let you in because you were already signed in maybe on your browser. Let me log out then. Okay. 
just to make sure yep you're right it was unimpressive <laughs> okay all right so, so point to keep in mind uh case matters with yep. SAML assertions. So, it, and um, in the single sign on where we had the problems, it was actually the Federation ID was being passed in. And that also is case sensitive. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. All right. All right. Anything you want to touch on, Natalia, before I wind up? Um, I just want to open it up to a group. Did anybody else try the trailhead or the SAML validator? What kind of other insights did you gain from it? If anybody wants to share. And if you're talking, please unmute. <laughs> this is Terry. On the um, validator, do you always have to paste in that response? I, I was thinking with Azure that when I've done it before that I could go into that screen and, and validate without, and it would always just show me whatever the last authenticated, or the last attempted user. Uh, yeah, there. And I thought I had seen that too, where I yeah. went, validated yeah. successfully and it showed up. Even I've seen that. That's why I didn't pay attention. But uh, maybe, yeah, uh, I, I don't know what happened. Uh, maybe if you're in the same session, then, uh, then it'll have it by default. Yeah, because Terry, I thought I saw that too, that I logged in and I went to the validator and, it's, and it showed me that whatever I yeah. had done was successful and I didn't have to copy paste the assertion in. Okay, exactly. And we have somebody from an 804 number. I'm not sure who that is, but you're unmuted. So if you have something to say, please say it. Okay. This is John, and um, I'm muting on my phone, so that's all. But oh, gotcha. Have okay. <laughs> all right. Cool. Justine Rock. Justine Rock. That's all. I, that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> I, work, I work with him, and I paid him to say this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, has anybody else had experiences with single sign-on issues? Igor wants to know there is a known case-sensitive issue in SSO. Provided a link. Thank you, Igor, for that. Um, so has anybody done any single sign-on where you ran into some SAML validation issues and you had to troubleshoot it, if, if you want to share your experiences? Actually, um, uh, my experience in the past is you know, when we implemented, in my pr previous employer, uh, when we implemented custom, sorry, community cloud, uh, we looked at SAML uh, for SSO first, and then there was some issue, um, some limitation for the external system to generate SAML, so they were not able to do that. So that's when we uh, uh, explored OAuth uh, options for SSO, and we ended up using JWD to token flow for SSO. So I just want to share that, you know, so SAML is not the only um, way you can uh, establish SSO. Okay. Well, I just yeah. might have to schedule you to present the JWT token flow then when we get to that point, <laughs> since you already had experience with it. Okay. Uh, if we have no other comments, thank you, Jasim. Uh, you can yeah, stop just presenting. To, just to add to what Jasim said, uh, uh, this is probably more than a year ago, so I don't quite remember the details, but when we generated the, the SAML metadata file uh, for the community, uh, there are a couple of uh, URLs within the file. It was generating both the the one uh, with the my domain for the community and the my domain for the internal, and the sequence sort of mattered. Uh, and the very first one was the internal one, and the second one was the the community. And there are some reference attributes there as well. We had to manually sort of edit that and then exchange that metadata file with the IDP, and and that solved the issue. It's been a while ago, so I don't quite know the details. But yeah, there were some nuances with the community. Huh. OK. So when we get when we start deep diving into community stuff, that will that might come up for us. Thank you, Satish. OK, so let's go back to me presenting. And again, so this is the time when we're going to talk about OAuth in very broad strokes, just kind of what is the concept of OAuth versus um, OAuth versus SAML. So I, we're going to do this kind of like we did with SAML. We're just going to go round robining, and I'm just going to pick on people to give their inputs on what they think um, is important to know about OAuth at a high level. And Terry dropped off. I think he'll probably join back in shortly. But in the meantime, uh, we'll go to Madhavi. What do you think?
And Madhavi, make sure you unmute your mute button. Uh, Natalia, I'm, I'm really sorry for this session. I didn't prepare uh, uh, well, and then I'm not, uh, uh, I didn't had any previous experience on the OAuth. Maybe I need to pass this. <laughs> okay. I promise next week I'll come prepared. <laughs> all right, awesome. That's honest. It happens to all of us. We get behind this behind a little bit, and that's just how. Yeah. It works. Joseph, how about you? What do you want to tell us about OAuth? Hey, this is the same thing. This is my first session. <laughs> I guess. I do. <laughs> You're doing so great. Really you got all the wrong people. Yeah. You're yeah. picking on wrong people, Natalia. <laughs> okay. I'll, all be, right, I'll make sure that next session I'll be prepared. Uh, this is my first session. Sorry for that. All right, all right. Edith, how about you? Edith, reach for that mute button. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, um, OAuth is an open standard uh, that is used for authorization. And it's important to know that it's an open standard because every implementation can change according to the provider. Um, there are many um, concepts in OAuth, for example, um, scopes and consent. That That is uh, what the user is, uh, is uh, asked to approve. And for example, when you go to Facebook and you you're gonna approve to, to go into another application using Facebook. Um, there is a small screen that, that tells you this application can access all of this and won't access all of this. Uh, for example, it cannot uh, post uh, um, messages on your behalf or things like that. And that is a, a consent. And that is important because later we, we will need to, um, to define the scopes when we are uh, configuring the OAuth in Salesforce, for example. And something also very important is the tokens. Uh, the access token is the, the like I, I would say, like sort of the equivalent to the SAML assertion that is passed through and for uh, from between services or IDPs. And there is also the refresh token that you can use uh, when your access token that is uh, time limited uh, expires. So you can request another token from the uh, IDP or well, the OAuth uh, server to be able to access the applications uh, that you that you user or you uh, authorized. Basically that, I guess. Nice, thank you. All right, Igor, welcome to the party. You're up next. Hello. Uh, <laughs> OK, um, so I think uh, Edith gave a very good introduction to OAuth as an authorization flow. A um, couple of things I would add is something that a lot of people probably miss unless you actually implement the OAuth in code uh, is that when it relates to Salesforce or even Facebook or anything else, uh, OAuth is actually a two-step process uh, in authorization uh, where when you make a, a request to a front door, to uh, uh, what you get is actually something called a, um, a code token, uh, which is then you send back to Salesforce, and only then you receive back the actual access token. So you essentially um, have to do these uh, two round um, requests uh, in OAuth. And now, in typical scenarios, when you're dealing with tools or configuring things from admin perspective, you never really see that. It's all done behind the scenes. So as long as you configure your OAuth, like for example, mobile applications use OAuth frequently for their authentication. And mobile SDK handles this type of OAuth dance under the covers. Um, but if you ever wanted to do that in, let's say, Java or um, uh, other like uh, languages in programming, then you have to be aware of these um, OAuth dense trickeries that's happening behind the scenes. I like that. It's a dance. It's not a flow. It's a dance. I like that much better. And that's true. There is that give and take between the, the client and the server. Yeah. Uh, I actually have I, I have on my GitHub a uh, several examples written in different languages, one in Java, one in Swift server side, um, uh, and then um, I have Node.js that I'm currently also implementing, which actually implements the full Salesforce authentication flow in code and it does all these steps and creates a simple server and kind of demonstrates how all these uh, codes get passed around where you 
making requests and receiving a response and then sending back the code uh, to a token URL. And then you're getting back uh, the actual uh, session uh, uh, token, which now you can session and refresh token, by the way, uh, if you are allowed to get a refresh token by your uh, scopes, as was mentioned earlier. And then you can store your session uh, uh, refresh token somewhere in your uh, browser uh, cookies or potentially in your mobile device if you're using uh, that. And then uh, from there, you can refresh the uh, session token again. Nice. Uh, another, another important point I think that might be, I don't know if it will come up on an exam or not, uh, the authorization code uh, that you receive on the first step is very short-lived um, token, so you can't really hang out for that for an hour. So it only lives for about you know less than ten minutes or so. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if that is. I think there's some way it's documented how long. So maybe is it ten or fifteen minutes is a max of how long it might live. Uh, and after that, it's invalid anymore, so you can't use it. You have to essentially authenticate yourself again. Okay, great. Thank you. Jasim. I'm going to skip you since you just did a whole presentation, so you can rest a little bit until the end if you want to throw something else in. Uh, Paulina. Remember your mute button, Paulina. Yes, I'm mute and I have a pretty bad call, so it's going to be difficult. <laughs> it's okay. So, um, I don't think I can explain much today because I don't have a voice. But I know there are multiple flows, and depending on your scenario, you can pick different, um, you know, one or the other one. Um, I found a very nice uh, all the slide um, presentation that have um, the sequence diagram for the flows. So I'll probably post it there. Great, that's a good one. But um, I honestly don't have, you know, I have a headache. I'm pretty sick today, so I don't think I can talk much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Tis the season to be sick. So th thank God we're all meeting virtually. We can't share germs over the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not those kind of viruses anyway. Yeah. All right. Different flows. So that I think um, there are going to be a lot of questions around what flow you should use in each scenario. Yeah. I started wrestling with the flows this morning. That was fun. Yeah. All right. Pavitra. Uh, so OAuth is more of an authorization than authentication. It's more like you are uh, providing a token to do something on behalf of the user. So uh, like most of the example I've seen about the valet uh, car driver, right? So it's more like if I have to simplify that, it's more like if you are um, giving a valet key to the valid drivers you are just giving them a key just to drive and they cannot be uh, able to open the trunk or any of these things so you are just giving a specific functionality to do on behalf of the user so that's the that key is more like an access token where um, the <clears throat> the other service provider has specific access to do that functionality Good point. Thank you, John. If you're at a point where you can, oh, you are unmuted. Or if you're at a point where you can safely unmute the mute on your phone. Um, oh, yes, you can. Cool. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I have the background music for me today. Um, I'm in a hotel right now, so yeah, it's been crazy. Um, I, I really don't have much to add. I mean, literally, the point that I was thinking about was uh, what the young lady just said, and the fact that OAuth is more about author edition, not and not really authentication. At least that's the way I've heard it described. So I don't really have much to add beyond that. So. Okay, cool. Satish, how about you? I think most of us covered um, a lot of the detail. What uh, when I started looking at OAuth, uh, I read through some of the things, and I I, I said this before. Um, the whole OAuth came about because of um, you know this this need for system to system integration, where we are you be used to uh, you know uh, create credentials, you know username, passwords, and store that um, in the consuming system. The issue with that was that um, you know when the when the password uh, if it, one is you have to share the credentials, right? So you have to sort of manage those passwords. 
and uh, there is no easy way to sort of revoke it uh, uh, other than just revoking the whole access for it right you'd have mm -hmm. to actually probably uh, you know change the password or something like that or uh, revoke the access with OAuth, what it does provide you is, is it provides you that access through tokens, and these tokens have an access token the, and the, the refresh token. Right? So access token is a short-lived uh, based on your session timeout, and then it, it times out, so you use your refresh token to keep getting the, uh, the new token. And the, the administrator has the, the power to sort of administer and revoke these tokens, and you don't have to manage passwords. And you initially have to authenticate and then you get the token and once you get the token you can sort of manage that so that's my two cents on what OAuth is of course there's a lot of flaws and, and the, in, in, in practical sense where I've seen this in use is in all of those uh, connected apps right where we have the app exchange packages where either there's a service out there that, is, that needs to access um, um, Salesforce, it can access on behalf of a you know a user or a system or, or an integration account, and then you don't really have to share the credentials with the the system, um, but you you authenticate once and then it starts storing the tokens and it can manage the tokens from there on. So that's my experience. Cool. Yeah, I, so I read that valet key example, and I really don't like that example because it says, well, the valet can drive your car, but they can't unlock the trunk. Well, yeah, they probably can actually with that key. So I thought, okay, what's a better analogy? There's got to be a better analogy out there. I came up with a couple of them. Um, I'm going to put them out there. You guys tell me if I'm close or if for some reason the analogy doesn't work. So analogy number one is power of attorney. Um, if you have aging parents or if you've ever had to um, maybe act on behalf of somebody else. You, there's this concept of power of attorney where <clears throat> I go and I sign a document saying, for example, I give my husband very limited access to act on my behalf for a specific transaction. So I have to go, I have to get a document notarized, prove to somebody that I am who I say I am. And now my husband has this document that says Natalia Murphy has given me power of attorney to, let's say, um, purchase a car in her name. And so he can go to the car dealership. He says, look, I have a power of attorney. I can do this on Natalia's behalf. I don't have to be there to do that because I have given him permission to act on my behalf with the car dealer. Um, but what he can't do is go open an account in my name because I didn't give him that scope of access. I only gave him permission to buy a car for me. I didn't per give him permission to open a bank account. So that's scenario number one. Um, another one I thought of that might be useful is if you, uh, for example, if you change doctors, like you move across the country and you want to get your old medical records from your old doctor and you want to give them to your new doctor, um, they have you fill out a medical release form and you say, I am releasing my records from this doctor to this doctor and you can specify what records do you want released. Do you just want a history of your office visits to come over? Or do you also want to include lab reports, for instance, and x-rays as part of what you're providing? So that's the scope is what information can one doctor share with the other? And then the expiration, you can also set an expiration date on there, um, just like you can for power of attorney, where you can say this is only good for a year or it's only good for three months. And that limits the scope um, during which that other person can act on your behalf or in the case of the doctor's office, it limits the time frame during which the doctor can send information to the other doctor's office. So, am I close? Am I way off the mark? Those of you that have worked with OAuth. Yeah, I think I think it's pretty it's pretty good um, analogies, uh, Natalia. Uh, those those are giving power of attorney. That's kind of uh, what I what I think of OAuth usually. Uh, for like web applications or mobile applications that are living outside of your domain, but uh, they somehow need access to the data in Salesforce or maybe some other backend system, right? If they are, uh, the, the OAuth doesn't live only with Salesforce, it exists in any other environment as well, like Google Apps or uh, Facebook or other things like that. So pretty much any any of these uh, tools support supporting OAuth uh, uh, 2.0 protocol uh, would have the same kind of uh, functionality. OK. All right. And then, Jasim, you've had some time to recover from your presentation. Was there anything you wanted to add to what's already been said about OAuth? Um, 
I think everyone pretty much uh, covered uh, everything on OAuth. I just want to touch on one more point. Um, you know, we, we talked about uh, we can get rid of the, the passwords um, then around in the system using OAuth. You know, we, we exchange and take tokens. But uh, it's also um, interesting to see that there is one flow in OAuth, which is username password flow. So if, if the user is already have the credential, then you can use that flow. I don't think that is recommended, but uh, there is a flow with the username and password. And uh, we use that uh, when we um, integrate, you know, like for example, we have um, an external system that we wanted to integrate that pump data to us, to Salesforce. And we created an integration user, the API only user, and then we use username password to uh, for that integration, username password flow. Um, so just want to keep it uh, out. Yeah. All right. And, and we're going to get into flows and do great detail. <laughs> so yeah. it's coming. Um, yeah. And username and password, um, that's one of those where beware of using it because it's the least preferred of any other method. But if nothing else works, that's kind of your last resort flow to use. But again, we're going to deep dive into that later. So Thanks for playing along. Um, just a reminder to everybody that uh, these are the links to the schedule and the resource guide. The schedule has changed dramatically since last week, so be sure you take a look at it. Um, the presentation schedule is always fluid, so just keep that in mind. And then let me refresh that because I realized that I hadn't gotten it. And look, the text magically appeared. Um, so for and this should say Monday's presenters, not Friday's presenters. Um, but again, so before Monday, again, we're going to continue down the SSO path for a little while longer. And so your next topic of study is Identity Connect, and which basically works with Active Directory. So the first link is a quick overview of how do you work with Active Directory and Identity Connect. And then the second link, that's a trailhead module. And so you get a shiny new badge when you're done on how Identity Connect works. Um, now, because it requires an on-prem AD server, you won't really be able to do any hands-on work with it, but understand the concepts. And then for Monday, again, this is Monday's presenters, not Friday's presenters. Uh, we're going to have Terry talking about uh, delegated authentication. And Svatka will be talking about Identity Connect. And then Paulina will talk about what's the difference between delegated and federated authentication. And when would you want to use each one? Um, so if there are any questions, now is the time, I believe. Let me see. Any questions? I wanted to have a question to the group, actually. I don't know if uh, anybody uh, heard or has any uh, reference or resources. As studying for some of this identity stuff, um, I bumped into some something that uh, I, I've seen documentation. We have authentication flows, and particularly related to OAuth, there is web server flow, there's user agent flow, there's JWT uh, bearer token, and all that stuff. It's all well explained and clear. But then I bumped into something. There is also a question uh, around authorization flow, and I seem to can't find the documentation around that. Uh, it always comes back to the authentication flow. And I'm just wondering, are these are the same thing? Am I just confusing the two terms together, or is just simply uh, English language terminology here? Hmm, that's a good question. Is it in the study guide where it talks about like authentication versus authorization flows, or where are you seeing that? No, I, I just in the, in the, some of the references and stuff I've uh, I've seen people uh, mention sometime in the blogs or things as I as I go through some of the uh, um, studies through the. Uh, trail mix, which I couldn't access yesterday for some reason, but uh, but uh, uh, it, I've I've seen it in in like maybe one or two places mentioned, and I don't know if that is really a typo, right? Or this is really there is really a thing. I tried to research like is there authorization flow that I don't know about, uh, and I couldn't find uh, like end documentation. So I don't know if anybody heard of that before. Huh. Yeah, because I'm noticing like even the titles in like the SSO guide and the Salesforce documents say like they'll say web server authentication flow, but really yes. it's authentication and authorization. Right, flow. right. And so that's that's my question is like it, it might be just, uh, you know, kind of a uh, 
putting the two together, or is it just basically assumption that authorization really means authentication and vice versa, it's all the same thing, right? <laughs> right. Just, just interpretation of like, hey, I, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised that I will hit several questions that will have both of those terms. Um, and I wouldn't know, okay, what am I? <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to answer here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is one specific um, point in the study guide that says, given a scenario, articulate whether it's describing authentication, authorization, or accounting. And so, yeah, it'll definitely be in there. Is it like Salesforce documentation that you're seeing yeah. that says? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's in the, uh, I've seen it in some uh, uh, kind of, like I said, one or two places. It's not, it's not very common. Most of, most of the time I see authentication flow and, and Salesforce documentation typically talks about authentication flow. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, that there's another thing like that. And I'm just, I was just curious if this is something I'm having seen before maybe maybe there is a document maybe there's actually a list of authorization flows out there so i definitely want to know if there is a... when i was uh, you know m making the examples for the authorization authentication i i struggled with the same thing i looked through the stuff and uh specifically with oauth right um the authorization like natalia said comes uh, where the scopes are you know assigned the profiles are assigned and what is the profile that has access to this connected app if the profile is system, system admin then you have you have the uh, authorization for all of the salesforce org if that is a you know restricted profile with a restricted set of permission sets and that's the only thing that you have that you are authorized to access that's how i see it uh, it's the scopes that drive the authorization but the actual flows are authentication flows because without authenticating, uh, the user is authenticating um, on the system's behalf, but without that authentication, right, you don't get the, the login uh, token or the, or, the, or, or the token, access token. Makes sense? Or I don't know if, I, if that helps. Yeah, or maybe like the authorization is like that specific subset where the user has to say, yes, I give this permission access to, you know, look at my profile. Or let's say I'm on Facebook. Do I want to really want to give this application access to my friend list and to post on my wall or do I not? And maybe that's the authorization. Igor, I would say when you find that text that looks confusing, um, quote it and put it in the architect community and see if somebody out there could answer it. Okay. Yeah, actually, uh, so uh, Satish just mentioned something interesting uh, regarding the like system admin. Um, and I think uh, in the past when I worked with uh, particularly uh, mobile applications or web applications external to Salesforce, and that's very specific to Salesforce now and connected apps, uh, those scopes that we define in connected apps actually restrict my user access. So I, I, I could be an admin. But if I came in through the mobile app or through web app that only had an API access, well, I may be having the world access when I go through UI, but with that same admin user, I was only able to hit API. I wouldn't be able to hit Visual Force pages or hit, uh, let's say, web resources on content uh, or some other kind of resources on Salesforce uh, org. And so it sounds, it sounds like connected app actually serves as this gatekeeper um, with, these, with these scopes that could limit uh, users' uh, authorization in this case. Huh. Yeah, I think for me to, to understand the difference, you know, in simple words, um, authentication is all about who you are and authorization is the scope or what you can do. So once you once I understood that you know whatever flow even if there is an authorization flow if it is talking about scope or or the the power or the access the, that you get in Salesforce then you know I understand okay this is authorization uh, but like Sadish said you know the, the the entry point is authentication you need to have that login uh, so that you know you you get access so that's how I understood. I, and I think along those lines, when whichever mechanism you come through, you ultimately become a user that has a profile. And that profile has, let's say, access to data and those various pieces. So you might 
get access through the connected app to additional APIs. But if you don't have access to a particular object, that cannot be given to you through any of the things that's through that scope. That scope is more, okay, so can I find out some additional API to get, you know, uh, different levels of things or get access to what the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think the, the best way to pronounce it, but I don't think you're given authorization to what things they can get a hold of. You might be giving some additional authorization to other APIs they can get access to, if, if oh, that helps. Yeah. What I was making a point at is actually that those scopes are actually filtering you out from what you normally would have access to, um, at least in my experience with connected apps and scopes. Now, you're absolutely correct that once I logged in and that user has a profile and permission sets, whatever those permissions are given to me, sure, if I try to maybe hit row API and do queries, yeah, I could have access to all these records that I've been shared with. I could see all these objects and, and, and data and all that stuff through the API. That's fine. But if I want to do, let's say, access web resources or I wanted to access uh, you know, maybe, maybe a Visual Force page through that same channel of connected app, uh, that would not be given to me if I didn't have that scope defined in the connected app. Right. Even though, even though in, in real terms, if I went with that same user through community or, th or not through, uh, through the UI, then I would have access to all these uh, Visual Force pages or anything I wanted to do. Okay. And again, that is because it's an external app and it right. only needs limited access and we want to restrict access as much as possible. Um, and we don't want to give apps the keys to the kingdom. Great discussion. Anything else from anybody? OK, then. So for Monday, Terry Svatka and Paulina, you are on deck. Um, we're going to deep dive into SSO and communities for another week. And then the fun starts with OAuth. So it's coming, people. <laughs> so be prepared. Um, but I am going to stop the recording, and we'll call this session done. I'll hang out until the last person drops. Everybody have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you all on Monday. <laughs>